guys, welcome back to the studio. This week will be the start of a new series that I'm going to be calling Master Studies. In this series, we'll be looking at some of my favorite artists whose solos had the most impact on my playing. I'll take you through some of my favorite recordings by masters of the jazz idiom, and then we'll pick apart some of my favorite lines that I've ever transcribed. In this first episode, we're going to be looking at some lines from somebody who's quite possibly my favorite tenor saxophone player of all time, Dexter Gordon. You guys ready? Let's get into it. When I was in college, I went through a period where pretty much all I practiced was rhythm changes. I really wanted to be able to play effortless lines on those chords like I heard all of my favorite musicians doing. One of my friends at the time turned me onto a record by the one and only Dexter Gordon. Released in 1962, Go! is arguably one of my favorite records of all time. The whole album is just a non-stop masterclass in bebop phrasing and language. Now, Dex had such a huge sound and an incredibly assertive time feel that I still can't get enough of. The track on this record we'll be looking at today is his Rhythm Changes tune, Second Balcony Jump. I'll take you guys through three of my favorite licks from the solo, and then we'll do a little bit of analysis on each one of them to see what makes them tick. Let's start off with this first one. Here, take a listen to it. That first phrase happens at the end of the bridge, heading back into the A section at the end of his first chorus. Let's pick that one apart a little deeper now. Starting off, he plays this neighbor tone idea off the chord tones of G minor, and then resolves it to the 7th of the F7 like this. Then he does one of my favorite moves that I still use a lot on rhythm changes to this day. He plays E flat melodic minor over this F7. He uses two half steps in this scale run to land here on the 5th of the E flat, and then actually resolves to the tonic early. Then he plays into the A section with this little diminished lick off the G flat to land on the ninth of the B flat at the next bar. Then we get some rhythmic phrasing that's all based around the major pentatonic. My favorite thing here is the blue note that he uses here, where he alters the phrase a little bit before popping out into a bebop run to end the phrase like this. That run starts on the seventh of the E flat seven, runs up to the second with two half steps. Then he just comes back down the scale with two more half steps to land on the third of the B flat right on the downbeat. Then it's more B flat major scale with a little callback to the neighbor tone idea that started us all off. Now let's check out that lick one more time a little slower. Now let's check out another brilliant phrase that he plays a little later on in the solo. This one is my favorite line in the whole solo. It's possibly my favorite line that I've ever transcribed. I really learned a lot from this one, and I'm still cribbing ideas from it all these years later. This one comes in at around 218 and happens over the A section of his second chorus leading into the bridge. Check it out. There's so much cool stuff happening in this lick. He starts it off strong by just hitting a long note on the fifth of the B flat to let you know he's about to play a new idea. When we get into the lick proper, it's pretty simple stuff at first. Just goes up the B flat major scale over the first two chords until we get this arpeggio down from the seventh of the C minor seven. This is where stuff gets really cool though. Instead of pivoting to the A that you might expect coming off of this arpeggio, he goes to a C sharp and then plays what's quite obviously an A7 arpeggio to get to this F when we arrive at the D minor 7. The first time I heard that, it absolutely blew my mind. 
just looking at this from a theory standpoint, I wouldn't ever think this would work because you've got an E natural right there. And that's supposed to clash super hard against the F7, but somehow it doesn't. I think it works because he hits the E on an upbeat and he gets away from it pretty quickly. Not only that, but the rest of the notes in this arpeggio line sort of line up with an F augmented ninth chord, which is pretty hip. On top of all that, it's just a really cool sounding secondary dominant idea that gets us to the next part of the chord progression. Moving on, he plays this little turn off the root of the D minor and then comes down to the third of the G. Then he jumps up to the flat ninth and comes down what appears to be C harmonic minor till he lands at the third of the C minor on the downbeat of the next bar. This is another incredible line and it always reminded me of something you might hear in a Bach prelude. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Once he gets to the third of the C minor, he just walks up the scale and then resolves into the third of the B flat seven like this. Then we get some more bebop playing here like this. He's just playing chromatically to the ninth and then coming down the B flat seven scale and then jumping up to the fifth of the E flat. He ends the phrase by playing more of that super slick E flat melodic minor to act as this really neat altered dominant sound that gets us back to the home key like this. Here, take another listen to how that lick sounds a little slower. Let's take a look at one more line from this solo. This one comes in at about 249 and covers the first half of the A section in his fourth chorus. starts off with a really cool syncopated enclosure idea. Starting off on the root of the B flat, he's really just coming down the scale to the fifth. The way he interrupts it though, makes the rhythm of that scale sound like this. The chromatic notes he puts in between work by jumping down a third and then approaching the next scale note by a half step. He skips the chromatic approach on the last one so he can land on this F right on the downbeat though. The motif of moving down a third continues here, which jumps down to D and then runs up to the root from there. The phrase then continues in the third bar by starting off on this A and just playing an upper neighbor tone before running down the scale to the fifth. This time though, that fifth is functioning as the seventh of this G7. Once he gets there, he uses a half step to get down to the root of the C minor in the next bar like this. Then we get this little phrase, which is a little bizarre, but that I absolutely love. We get a hard resolution to the sharp 11th of F here, and then this enclosure to B flat before resolving down to the 7th of the B flat 7th. Then he finishes up the A section like this. The beginning of it almost sounds kind of like a whole tone scale idea coming down from the flat 13th of B flat, and then resolves by half step into the 7th of the E flat 7. He surrounds the 5th of the E flat 7, and then uses his favorite trick, the E flat melodic minor scale to get into the third of the B flat. Then he plays up the chord from there with a kind of lopsided rhythm and approaches the tonic from below and ends the phrase on the fifth. He does that a lot since it's a pretty consonant sounding thing to do, but it also lets you know harmonically and rhythmically that something else is about to happen. Let's have one more listen to how that sounds now under tempo. sticking around at the end of the video. I hope you guys get why this is one of my absolute favorite solos that I've ever transcribed. The whole thing is just chock full of great phrases like this, and we can really learn a lot about effective phrasing and time feel from Dexter's playing. Transcription is such a powerful tool, but we really need to be able to put these licks under a microscope and turn them into concepts or rules in order to really get the most out of it. If you need some more reinforcement on this stuff, make sure you watch my videos on pivot arpeggios and practicing scales on standards. Those will give you some more background on how I'm choosing to analyze and make sense of these lines. While you're at it, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss an upload. 
I'll be doing more of these master studies in the coming weeks, and there's going to be a lot more great licks coming your way. If you guys want even more licks from this solo, or even better, the whole transcription, both my favorite selections, as well as the entire transcribed solo, can be found over at my Patreon page. You can also find all of the written material from every other video here on the channel, along with monthly bonuses for patrons only. As always, a deep and heartfelt thank you goes out to my incredible patrons. PH, Josh, David Zuckerbron, Patrick Caron, and Jazz Luminaire patron Vibhav Bhakti. Thank you guys so much for your support. Thank you to all of you for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.